a bit like the, the Ten Commandments in the Christian tradition. But. I'm sure he'd be flattered by that. <laughs> In January 1908, when Scouting for Boys was set for publication, Arthur Pearson orchestrated the marketing. He decided that rather than publish it as a single volume, it should first be serialised in separate parts, which you had to wait for and could collect. Scouting for Boys was a success virtually from day one. By the time the sixth fortnightly instalment came out, boys were queuing to buy it. Ben Powell's original idea was that scouting would piggyback on existing boys' movements. But then when the book came out, scouting appealed in such a way that boys wanted to scout themselves. So Ben Powell had more or less to scramble to catch up with the wildfire success of the book. So the movement followed the book. It's one of the few if not only instances I think in world history of a book having generated a movement. And one of the secrets of the movement's success is right there in the opening section. This is a very famous painting of a scout and it shows a boy in that classic scout uniform and I think we've all seen it so often that you forget how very odd it is. The hat is a South African hat from the constabulary where um, Baden Powell was serving. Then the shirt, which is an army shirt, a long army shirt worn in India and Afghanistan. And basically the army had fashioned it on the traditional Muslim shirt. Shorts, um, which no one in this country wore at all. Parents had to sort of cut off long trousers to make them fit. So it's an odd collection of things, but Baden Powell always claimed they were all practical. The hat, you could uh, carry water in. Uh, the shirts, if you put two of the shirts together and shoved the staves that the scouts carry, they turn into a stretcher. The scarf turned into a sling, um, again, for emergencies. And the figure here on the right isn't a scout. But the suggestion is, in a fairly obvious way, that he's blessing the entire scout movement. <laughs> Baden Powell also ordained a hierarchy of officers, invented a scout salute, and composed a scout oath. On my honour, I promise to do my duty to God and the King. I will try to help others, whatever it costs me. I know the scout law and will obey it. Crucially, the scout law wasn't a list of forbidden acts, but one of positive aims. A scout's honour is to be trusted. A scout is loyal. A scout's duty is to be useful and to help others. A scout is a friend to all and a brother to every other scout. In Scouting for Boys, Baden Powell also gave the movement something critical. The impression it already had a history. The British Empire had quite a propensity for inventing traditions, in other words, for making up a movement, an idea, an organisation, and then passing it off, or indeed marketing it, as something traditional and conventional and steeped in the past. Scouting, of course, does so by harking back to what Baden Powell calls the Scouts of History. In the old days, the knights were the scouts of Britain, and their rules were very much the same as the scout law which we have now. We are their descendants, and we ought to keep up their good name and follow in their steps. Baden Powell even suggested that scouting had a lineage that led all the way to the king. He noted that the king signs himself R.I. Rex Imperator, the emperor. He says, Imperator comes from two Roman words, im and perere, which together mean to prepare for, that is, to be prepared, which rather neatly makes the king the chief scout. It's neat, but it isn't true. Imperator just means he who rules, but no one was going to object, and certainly not the king. Edward VII returned the favour in autumn 1909, when he knighted Baden-Powell. 
By now, the Scout movement had over a hundred thousand members. Scout troops were patrolling across the country. And a spin-off magazine was flying off the newsstands. Scout fever had gripped the nation. Scouting offered something special that other groups didn't. At its core was a belief in the positive power of play and make-believe. Scouting for Boys is peppered with ideas for staging little plays, dramatising poems, putting on a show, and it encouraged each boy to imagine himself as a potential hero on the bigger stage of life. Playing and play-acting had always been central to baden Powell's understanding of the world. Peter Pan, one of the most popular shows of the age, was especially dear to him. Baden-Powell was particularly fixated on it, even more so than its standard enthusiastic audience. I think that was because the figure of the boy who never grows up, who never loses his milk teeth, who never has to confront the horrors of sexuality, was to him a very, very compelling image. The idea that scouts were boys on the brink of sexual maturity was a problem for Baden-Powell. And the thought that they might be tempted to indulge in self-abuse, as the Edwardians termed it, horrified him. But in typically forthright manner, he drafted a section of scouting for boys to confront it directly. No prudish sentimentality for him. He even checked his copy with his mother. Pearson, his publisher, however, was much more coy. He rejected the original and Baden-Powell was forced to replace it with a watered-down version for instructors only. This is from the appendix on masturbation and this is what he wanted to say. Uh, the result of self-abuse is always, mind you, always, uh, that the boy after a time becomes weak and nervous and shy, he gets headaches, probably palpitations of the heart, and if he carries on too far, he very often goes out of his mind and becomes an idiot. Yep. It's quite extreme, isn't it? It's very extreme. It's, it's more extreme than even fairly conservative medical authority would have gone in the early 20th century. But there was a huge amount of anxiety about uh, masturbation. Huge anxiety around masturbation because on the one hand it caused you know all these problems with health, it led to consumption, insanity etc. And on the other hand this argument that it's a manifestation of a lack of self-discipline, it erodes the willpower. If a boy gets into this habit he will not be a fit person to govern the empire. Part of me thinks that Baden-Powell is trying to do something quite healthy by saying we're far too prudish about this. I think it's good that he's, he's actually ventilating, he's talking about it. Uh, we want to get this kind of out in the open, out into the healthy fresh air and yeah. sunlight. Yeah. But Why do you think his publisher wouldn't put it in? There is this concern in saying, oh God, there's this terrible habit that boys get into at school in adolescence and they learn it from their evil companions, yada, yada, yada. Um, we should warn them about it. And then other people come back and say, no, they are pure innocent little lambs, you know, you will just put this evil thought into their mind. It's like the sex education debate, mm. you know, about, you know, whether you tell them or whether, you know, oh my God, you tell them about it and they go and do it. Mm. Don't lark about with a girl who you wouldn't like your mother or sister to see you with. Don't make love to any girl unless you mean to marry her. Despite his confident assertions, Ben Powell was no expert on the charms of the opposite sex. Whereas he would often apply the word beautiful to a man, he would never apply it to a woman. She might be good looking, but he would then often qualify it with a word like heavyish or some sort of slightly derogatory remark. I obviously read Baden Powell's diary remarkably carefully, and there was an entry in the diary which said just went to Charterhouse, saw Todd's photograph album, naked boys and trees, excellent.